Thanks for having me today. So my lab works on a number of bad viruses. There are actually five different Ebola viruses, only one of which is actually called Ebola virus. Uh, Marburg virus, we also work on viruses that are much more common, like loss of fever and lots of arena viruses. Today I'm going to tell you about Ebola, because it's been in the news. So this is Ebola virus. Um, it's a rapidly progressing virus, 50 to 90% lethal, depending on the outbreak. There's an, one of unprecedented scale going on this year in Africa. Uh, this virus has only seven genes. That's its entire genome. That is all it has to cause such tremendous mayhem. And so the theme of my lab is how does Ebola virus, and viruses like it, like Lassa, which only has four genes, how do they leverage what is essentially a, a handful of proteins into such extraordinary pathogenesis? I'm going to try to tell you two stories today. One, how the virus gets in. Another, how the virus gets out. So here's a cartoon of the virus. It's a long filamentous particle. It's got a membrane envelope. And studded into the membrane is a glycoprotein called GP. That is the only protein the virus expresses on the surface and is the only molecule it has to attach to and enter a new target cell. This is how the GP is organized. So the polypeptide N terminus C terminus, it has two subunits that's cleaved in the producer cell by furin. The part that binds receptor is called GP1. So if you're more familiar with HIV, that's like GP120. The part that fuses with the target cell is called GP2, so that's more like GP41. In the receptor binding subunit is the receptor binding domain. The GP2 has two heptad repeats that collapse into a six helix bundle infusion, just like flu, HIV. GP1 also has this unusual thing called a mucin-like domain. It's 150 amino acids. Um, lots and lots of glycan. So anywhere there's a square lollipop is an N-link glycan. There are too many O-link glycans to really know precisely in uh, the mucin-like domain. So that 150 amino acids winds up being about 75 kilodaltons after post-translational modification. And we don't really know what it's there for. It's not required for attachment, fusion, and entry in cell culture. In fact, a mucin-deleted GP is, slight, is just as infectious as wild type, if not slightly more so. So maybe it plays some role in the natural host reservoir. We don't know yet, but it's there. Three of these gather into a trimer on the surface of the virus. <clears throat> and it's a big complex. It's 450 kilodaltons in size. It took us about five years to get the first GP to crystallize. This is the structure we solved in 2008, the crystal structure of the Ebola GP ectodomain. So we cut off the transmembrane domains there down here. So the molecule is shaped like a bowl. There's the GP1s that bind receptor. That's like your GP120. And here's the GP2s that drive fusion. That's like your GP41. Now the odd thing about this, the GP2 contains a hydrophobic fusion peptide. So that hydrophobic peptide is what penetrates the membrane of the cell it wants to infect to start driving an infection. You might think that a hydrophobic fusion peptide should be buried inside the structure. But for Ebola, it's slapped on the outside like a fly swatter. So it makes a loop, and there it is. And the three GP2s actually wrap around the outside of the trimer and tie the thing together. So in this view, the viral membrane will be at the top, the bottom, the target cell will be toward the top. And if I roll it around, you can see that the fusion subunit, the white one, wraps all around the blue one, like thread around a spool. So in infection, it will uncoil and drive itself into the target cell and then cause the two membranes to fuse. Now, in the upper and outer reaches of that bowl, are, is a domain we call the glycan cap. It's this little bit here, and we call it that because it has four N-link glycosylation sites all in a cluster. Attached to the outside of the glycan cap is that odd mucin-like domain. Now, we couldn't ever crystallize any GP containing that heavily glycosylated very mobile domain, but it's a part of the protein, and so we wanted to understand what it looked like. So we couldn't grow crystals. We turned to small angle X-ray scattering and solution to try to model what the complete GP looked like. And that is this. So the core that we crystallized is the ribbon at the center. And then small angle scattering, which we did up the hill at ALS, gives you the cloud of the whole thing. So the mucin-like domains take up about this much more space. They're flexible. Maybe they're about that wide instead of the full width. But they effectively double the size of the molecule. And they send this upper and outer reaching glycosylated canopy over the GP. So that's sort of what it looks like on the surface of the virus before it fuses. Now here's the odd thing about Ebola virus, and what you might not be expecting. That is not the version of GP that binds its cellular receptor. 
Instead, something different happens. The virus is brought into the cell by a macropenocytosis-like mechanism. It's just brought right into the endosome. In the endosome, it is cleaved by human enzymes called cathepsins. The job of cathepsins is to cut off that whole carbohydrate cloud. So this is what it looks like before cleavage. This is what it looks like after cleavage. It strips the mucin, the glycan cap. It leaves a little core competent for MPC1 receptor. That's it. So that's what it looks like in the endosome. And this is now a new crystal structure of the cleave GP. So the first thing you can see is that there's no conformational change that happens on cleavage. All it does is lop off all those carbohydrate-rich regions. And it does that to better expose the receptor binding site, which is up there. So if you love California like I do, you know what a wave looks like. It's got a crest, it's got a trough. This is where you ride. So I think this receptor binding site looks like a wave to me. It's got a crest, it's got a trough. The crest contains a bunch of conserved lysine residues. These are conserved across the Ebola virus genus and the Marburg virus genus as well. The trough is hydrophobic. And this phenylalanine is conserved across a whole genus as well. So somehow the receptor interacts with this site. You can mutate any one of these, but not all of them. So there's some sort of general electrostatic attraction receptor up here. You cannot mutate things in here. This is some kind of critical interaction site, the receptor. OK. The important thing here is that there's two biologically relevant manifestations of this protein. This is what's on the surface of the virus. This is what's subject to antibody surveillance. This is what's in the endosome. This is what binds receptor. What does that remodeling mean for the immune response? The answer is nothing good. A lot of epitopes are clipped off. So you can see how you can get a lot of antibodies against these sites, and we know you can. But those antibodies and their epitopes are stripped right off the virus once it gets into the endosome. So you can bind all those high affinity antibodies you want, but they won't prevent the virus from entering a cell. Instead, the, the, in the cell, those are just cut right off and the virus doesn't care. It's left a perfectly functional receptor binding core. What you might really want to target would be that conserved receptor binding site. It's, it's nearly identical across the whole filovirus family, but it's hidden. If you could engineer an antibody against this site using this as an immunogen, it can't bind this version of the molecule because the site is hidden. So what works? Well, the other way you can ask what works is what neutralizes. This is an antibody that neutralizes. This is an antibody called KZ52. It was identified in a human survivor of the 1995 Kikwit Zaire outbreak. And KZ52, this is the crystal structure of the complex, the antibody's yellow. It's clever. It has bypassed all that changing stuff at the top, and instead it's anchored itself to the bottom. And what it does is it binds the white to the blue. It anchors them together. So it keeps it in its pre-fusion conformation, so it cannot unwrap and it cannot infect. So it prevents infection in cell culture. Okay. That works. What else neutralizes? This neutralizes. This is now a crystal structure of Sudan Ebola virus. It's 50% different in protein sequence. It's an entirely different virus. It causes the other half of the outbreaks. We solved its structure in complex with an antibody raised by John Dye Usamrid called 16F6. 16F6 does the same thing. It anchors the green to the white, also at the base of GP. And in fact, if you superimpose the structures, you can see even though the human antibody and the mouse antibody were raised in different scenarios, natural infection, immunization, human mouse, and they come at it from different angles, they have the same functional effect. They bound that spot. So the mouse and the human found the same solution. So at this point, this was two out of two crystal structures of Ebola virus GPs and neutralizing antibodies bound to them. So there are two possibilities here. Either this is a hot spot for neutralization, or you can only crystallize the GP with an antibody bound there. And with two structures, it's impossible to tell the difference. But we wondered if that was a hot spot. OK, now 16F6 hasn't yet been tried in primates, but KZ52 had. So KZ52 neutralizes beautifully in test tubes. It protected mice from lethal challenge. It protected guinea pigs from lethal challenge. It did not protect the primates. All the primates died, despite KZ52 treatment at a pretty high dose. So that was data we had in 2007. And in 2007, this was the best antibody known against Ebola virus. 
So if the best antibody we know doesn't protect, what hope is there? And there's a lot of thought in the field that maybe that meant that antibodies wouldn't work against Ebola virus. So there's no way antibodies could outcompete this rapid and lethal virus, especially because one viral particle has been thought to be a lethal dose. How can any one monoclonal scrub out that much virus? Okay. But in 2012, a number of labs working independently in isolation found that mixtures of antibodies would cure infection, even after severe disease had developed in the primates. So what are those antibodies that do work post-exposure? This is one of the two cocktails that worked well. This is called MB003. It was discovered at USAMRIN. We have its structures. It's three antibodies, 68, 13F6, 13C6. We've got crystal structures of two of them. They bind linear peptides in the mucin-like domain. So the piece of mucin-like domain is a little yellow bit in here. This is single particle electron microscopy from my Scripps colleague, Andrew Ward. This antibody is 13C6. It's the gray FAB, and here it's bound to the light cyan GP. It binds the glycan cap. So this cocktail will protect primates from a lethal dose, but it binds mucin, mucin, and glycan cap. It binds all the parts that it's told you got cut off in the endosome. These antibodies do not neutralize in cell culture. If you were picking your antibodies to try on primates based on things you were doing in cell culture in the lab, you would never have chosen these antibodies. Yet the combination works. And if you're mystified, so are we. So here's what we had. We had this antibody, which conferred neutralization in vitro, but no protection in vivo. And we had this combination, which conferred protection in vivo, but no neutralization in vitro. So why is that? Is it that that was somehow wrong, but binding the top was somehow right? Or was it that this was delivered all by itself, and this was a group of three? The idea that maybe you just needed a group of three was supported by the group of studies we had done at the time. The one antibody, KC52, by itself did not protect. A different cocktail of two antibodies gave some protection. Both groups that tried three got protection. They worked with different antibodies. Do you just need three? So here's where we were in the field in 2012. That limited set of data told us maybe you just need a cocktail. But if you need a cocktail, how many go in? Is three the magic number? Or if we found ones that were good enough, can we go with two? Would four be even better? But here's the more important point. Which antibodies are best, and how would we know? You need to down-select them in some way before you go into primates. But the in vitro assays did not predict in vivo function. How would you choose the antibodies you wanted to try? And then if you have to make a cocktail, obviously you want antibodies that work well together, not ones that compete with each other. So this was a complex problem. And there are nested sets of questions in there. And one problem we had was that we didn't have a very large sample size yet. I've just shown you a couple of structures. So here's what we did. We got the entire field on one page. Everybody that works on Ebola virus antibodies, except one or two labs, sent them to my lab. We blinded all the antibodies. We gave them all code names. And then we packaged, we did some quality control and standardization, and we packaged them in identical boxes. And then we sent the boxes back out to the field for everybody to do their, a different in vitro assay or a different in vivo assay. Do them all. We're going to figure out what tests best predict efficacy, where all these antibodies bind, what works best, and why. And so the beautiful thing about this is they're all blinded. The entire field is just agreeing on what the data says is best. Nobody knows whose antibodies are whose. And we're going to be able to map, figure out generally where they all bind, see if we can map epitope efficacy, and put together what ought to be the world's best cocktail, or at least a really good research benchmark for something better is developed later. So that money arrived in March. So to give you an idea of the timeline we're working on, that was about three months after patient zero was infected in Guinea this year. Now, we thought about doing this study in two different ways, a sort of a tortoise and a hare strategy. The tortoise strategy is to just do it properly, get as many antibodies as we can. We had 150 promised, blind them all. We're solving structures of all of them. We're doing in vitro assays, we're doing in vivo assays. We're going to answer the basic research questions, what works and why, and what's the best cocktail we can make. 
If you're looking at antibodies in just this lab, you're not going to get as good a cocktail as if you can choose from everything in the world. But that's going to take a couple years. And we thought, and this is thinking in 2012, what if there's an outbreak? What if we need something faster? That gave us the hair strategy. The hair strategy was to take the two cocktails that we knew worked, that's six antibodies in total, from the Army and the Public Health Agency of Canada, and solve structures of those six, mix and match, see if you can make something better from six than you could from those each groups of three. That became ZMAP. Okay, now, I didn't do this work. This was all done by Larry Zeitlin and Gary, um, Gary Kobinger, Larry Zeitlin, and Gene Ollinger. My job is structural biologist, talking head, and grant writer. But it's published, so I can tell you what it was. So here's what they did. This is the army cocktail, those three antibodies that I showed you that bind mucin, mucin, glycan, cap. They looked at them individually, all by themselves. Only 13C6 worked, and it gave partial survival, 33% of the animals. So they took 13C6, which was probably the best of those three, and recombined it with different sets of two of the antibodies in ZMAP. So this is from Gary Covinger's lab in Canada. So he had three antibodies in that cocktail. They made different combinations of 13C6 plus different versions of the other two. Then those went into animals, the five, the two parent cocktails and three different versions of ZMAP. Okay, so the first thing they did was using a very low dose, a suboptimal dose, a dose they knew was not going to give complete protection. Because by themselves, they all give complete protection. We're not going to learn anything. We're not going to distinguish among them. So if you give a very low dose, what happens? Here are the parent cocktails. No animals survive, or one from Zimab. But the mixtures all did a little better. Instead of 0, 1 surviving, we have up to 4 surviving. So the first thing you can learn from here is that maybe the green antibody is a little better than the yellow antibody because a couple more animals survive. This is a really small sample size of animals, but you could, you could guess. And the second thing you learn is that maybe these two cocktails, ZMAP1 and ZMAP2, are better than ZMAP3. So they took ZMAP1 and ZMAP2 and they put it into macaques. And then they went back to their high doses that they thought would confer protection. And they gave it to the animals three days after exposure to Ebola virus. Now, in this model, the animals typically die around day seven or eight. So this is day three. And with ZMAP1, all of the animals survived. ZMAP2, five out of six survived. So they took ZMAP1, which looked better. Again, small sample size, but looked better. They just called it ZMAP. And then they wondered, how far out can we achieve protection? Because there are two scenarios in which a person is exposed to Ebola virus. Either it's a doctor or a scientist stuck with a needle and they know they've been exposed and maybe they can get treatment right away. Or it's somebody that lives in Africa or a medical worker working and they don't really know when they've been infected. And then it might take a couple of days for that diagnostic to be done and it might take a while to get them to the treatment or get the treatment to them. How long can you wait to treat against this infection? They found that even when they gave the antibodies five days after infection, the ZMAP cocktail, six out of six animals would survive. And this is a disease model when these control animals would die around day six or seven. So these are very, very ill animals. So this was really exciting data, that you could actually confer protection that late in Ebola virus exposure. Now this data was obtained while the outbreak was going on. And, um, it was used compassionately, beginning in a couple of um, missionary medical workers in Liberia. And the media went crazy. They called it the secret serum. What is the secret serum? Well, it wasn't secret. It was unpublished, because they'd just gotten the data maybe a month earlier before it went to humans. And it was not a serum. It's a cocktail, but all right. If you've been following. <laughs> The uh, Ebola antibody literature, you knew exactly what these antibodies were. They were in all my synchrotron proposals. They were in all our grant proposals. We had been writing about these monoclonal antibodies for years. Uh, all we had done is mix them differently. Uh, but they hadn't been following the Ebola antibody literature. <laughs> so it was a mystery to them. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was pretty exciting. Uh, that it, it, maybe it helped them. I mean, we don't know. There's no control. There's no identical twin that wasn't treated on the same day. So we don't really know if it worked. But there were these anecdotal reports that, you know, soon after receiving the antibody, they, they got up and walked. And then, you know, we, we heard that she had been planning her funeral with her husband, and he had called his wife to say goodbye, and uh, they're alive and well. Um, so the media just couldn't get enough of it. So uh, they 
went crazy. I, I don't know what this is. Maybe some of you do. But it talks about ZMAP. Um, this is my staff signed to Zach, and he's looking at KZ52. It's not even part of ZMAP, but that's all right. <laughs> and Stephen Colbert even picked it up, but thankfully he only showed my hands. He didn't use my voice at all. So that was sort of a relief. And sometimes it seems to have worked. So this is Ken Brantley running out of Emory, uh, cured, giving the staff high fives. We were so grateful for that. Uh, this is a British nurse who was infected in Kenema, Sierra Leone, received ZMAP. Um, survived and went back to work in Africa. It was also given to three medical workers in Liberia. Two survived, one didn't. These are the two that survived, leaving their treatment center. And this was written about uh, the woman in red. She was actually already in a coma when she received ZMAP. So again, we don't know if it worked because there was no control, but whatever it, effect it had, it wasn't a placebo on her because she was in a coma. But they do, you know, they, they're sort of really nice anecdotal reports. It wasn't for ZMAP. She wouldn't have made it. And sometimes it wasn't enough. Uh, there's a 75-year-old Spanish priest who was evacuated um, back to Europe, and he did not survive. And then a doctor from Sierra Leone was given ZMAP, but again, he didn't survive. He was already in organ failure uh, when he received it. And this gentleman had been infected for a very long time before the treatment was given to him. And so because no clinical trial had been done, it is not known what the treatment window is. Maybe they were out of it, we don't know. That trial is scheduled for early this year, and that's data that, that we need to have because, um, again, the, the, we don't know the treatment window, the, the dosage is not known, it was just guessed from what worked in macaques. Okay, so what is ZMAP? <laughs> How does it work and what does it look like? Well, these, this is the structure of ZMAP. So this I did with, this is done in the lab of uh, my Scripps colleague, Andrew Ward. This is single particle electron microscopy. The glycoprotein is the gray bowl shape. So here's the GP1, here's the GP2. ZMAP is three antibodies, blue, green, and yellow. Blue is called 13C6. It came from the army, the MB003. It binds the glycan cap. It doesn't neutralize by itself. Its job is to recruit immune effector function. But here's the surprise. These are the other two components, 2G4 and 4G7. They both bind the base. They bind the same spot as KZ52. They neutralize in cell culture. They both neutralize in cell culture. So if they look just like KZ52, and they have a similar affinity, why didn't KZ52 work? Is the problem with KZ52 that it was delivered all by itself instead of in a mixture? Maybe you just need this thing up top to recruit immune effector function. But here's the other thing we learned from the structural studies. I've drawn the structure this way, but I can also draw it this way because these two antibodies bind the same site and they compete with each other for binding GP and isothermal calorimetry. So, are these effectively the same antibody? If they work the same way, and we think one's better than the other, then that simplifies the manufacturing problem, then we just make two instead of three. Or are they actually different? Do they confer some slightly different function in immunology? So those are studies that we're doing right now. The other thing is that if these are the same, does that give us an opportunity for improvement? So either we simplify the manufacturing by making two antibodies instead of three, or we just pick the, which one of these is better and we replace the, the extraneous one with something against another site. And now with this whole, we're getting the results now in from this whole blinded study. Uh, and we can pick some of the best ones from there. So what else is there? So this is what we have published so far. These are all the antibodies mapped against Ebola virus. We now know four that all bind the base. And in fact, 10% of the antibodies in our whole blinded pool bind the base, they all neutralize, they all protect, they're the best of, of, of all the antibodies we know against Ebola virus, and they all hit the same site. We know two against the glycan cap, this one went into ZMAP, this one didn't, and we know a whole bunch against the mucin-like domain. There are many that have been mapped up there, we've done structures of two. Interestingly, so although we've mapped a lot of antibodies to the base, the glycan cap, mucin-like domain, as you might expect, we haven't found any yet against the receptor binding site because it's cleaved. I mean, it's hidden and exposed upon cleavage. It's masked by the glycan cap before cleavage. So keep that fact in mind while we go to Marburg virus. Now, Marburg virus 
is a, also a filovirus, looks like Ebola virus, causes similar disease. There's a tremendous range in lethality depending on the strain of the virus. The most recent one from Angola is up to 90% lethal in Angolan school children. The 25% lethality was uh, 1968 viruses in European scientists. And it's also found in Central Africa. It's a very different virus. It is 70% different in protein sequence. Antibodies typically don't cross-react. We don't... Um, and it's also thought to be harder to neutralize. One key difference between Marburg and Ebola is that furin cleaves in a different spot. So in Ebola, furin in the producer cell neatly cuts right after the mesin domain, so all the mesin domain winds up attached to GP1, and GP2 is free. In Marburg, furin cuts in the middle of the mesin domain, so part of it is attached to GP2, part of it's attached to GP1. Also, you can see the green bar is bigger in Marburg than Ebola. So the mucin domain is larger in Marburg. Now it took us about six years to crystallize Marburg. And while we we're trying to figure out how to crystallize it, we were looking at it by small angle X-ray scattering, trying to understand the homogeneity of the protein, the shape, what we could learn about it. Before I show you Marburg, these are the corresponding parts of Ebola. This is the whole crystal structure. This is Cle. So here's the glycan cap. The difference is that the glycan cap pokes up here and it's missing there. This is what you look at when you first get your SACS results. It's a bead filling model. So all the pink gumballs are just beads that fill the envelopes that you're calculating. So this is cleaved Marburg. Ebola is shown in the surface. Marburg has this extra little bit, this wing sticking out to the side. We think that's the piece of mucin that's attached to GP2. We get a lot of antibodies against that site when we immunize mice with this, and they're partially protected. If you add back in the glycan cap, you see a bigger blob here. But instead of poking up like Ebola, it seems to extend down and interact with the wing. So it made the glycan cap is shifted in position. And then if you look at the whole mucin containing GP, here's what it looks like. So here's Ebola. The mucin's big and extends upward and outward. This is also confirmed by electron tomography from uh, Supermanium's lab that it's an upward, outward projection. Marburg, it's not as upward. It's more sideways. And we think that's because part of it's attached to GP2, part of it's attached to GP1. The information content in SACS is not real high, it's maybe 10 angstroms resolution. So you can't figure out what the polypeptide is in here. And in fact, you couldn't even tell if this was right side up or upside down. But whether it's right side up or upside down, it's still mostly sideways. So it looks like the mucin might be a little different in Marburg than Ebola. That was what we thought based on SACS alone. So in Ebola, the mucin and the glycan is up, and we get a lot of antibodies that bind the bottom, like AZ52, and they neutralize and they protect. If Marburg is indeed different, does that mean that this site, the receptor binding site, is going to be accessible in Marburg in a way that it wasn't in Ebola? Can we now use Marburg to elicit antibodies against the receptor binding site? We want that was pure speculation until a woman in Colorado survived Marburg virus infection. She went to Uganda on vacation and went into the wrong cave and she came back home with Marburg virus. She actually, after being extremely sick for a very long time, diagnosed herself after seeing a nature program about Marburg virus. <laughs> and she asked her doctor, do I have that? And it turns out that she did. Thank the Lord she's alive. Okay, she survived Marburg. Uh, my collaborator, Jim Crow, at Vanderbilt, made human antibodies from her cells. In that panel of antibodies was one called MR78. MR78 allowed us to crystallize Marburg GP. So these are the crystals. This is after six years of working at this. And we just solved the 3.6 angstrom crystal structure of the Marburg GP in complex with MR78. Bam, there it is in the receptor binding site. So this is the human antibody in yellow. The GP1, the receptor binding subunit, is blue. The fusion subunit, pink, GP2 is here. So it binds right into that crest. Remember the, the, the wave crest and trough? It binds right into the trough, anchors a little on the top of the crest. So this is how it binds in there. So one of the variable loops of the antibody, the long one, the CDRH3, projects into the wave trough. And it drops a tyrosine and a phenylalanine into this trough. Now that looked like something we'd seen before. It looked like something we saw in 2008. It looked like how the Ebola glycan cap binds into the Ebola receptor binding site. 
So this is the Marburg structure on the left, the Ebola structure on the right. We zoom in, or I'll just show you. Uh, the glycan tap also dumps similar aromatic residues into the similar place. So this antibody, to some degree, mimics the glycan cap. The other thing we saw when we did the structures of Marburg compared to Ebola and the other Sudan one we did, the receptor binding sites are conserved. Even though the proteins are 70% different in sequence, that spot is extremely similar. Well, that makes sense. They bind the same receptor, they should have the same receptor binding site. And in fact, the receptor binding site is so similar that we can also solve the structure of the same antibody bound to Ebola GP. There it is. So it cross-reacts across the filovirus family. The difference is, although it can bind any kind of Marburg, uh, it can bind cleaved Marburg, it can bind uncleaved Marburg, it can bind viral surface Marburg, it will only bind cleaved GP because that site is only exposed when Ebola is cleaved. So here are some of the remaining questions. They bind the same site. How come we never saw this before? We had been using all of the Marburg GPs that we were trying to use to solve structures to immunize mice. And we didn't get any antibodies against the receptor binding site from that panel of mouse antibodies. So is it that you needed a human longer CDRH3 to reach in there, uh, in which case you wouldn't have found it in a mouse, or is this just a fluke? Is this just a low sample size? Well, the mouse and human responses differ. And if this human, this woman, made this kind of antibody, and there's a whole lot of them like that in the panel, will other humans make this too? Well, now in this part of this large collaboration, we have some of our researchers are working with cohorts of survivors of Marburg virus infection, and we'll be looking at what kind of antibodies they have made to survive. So we've done a lot of work trying to understand all the different parts of filoviruses. I'm gonna show you now the thing that's moving at the bottom. As I told you at the start of the talk, Ebola only has seven genes, that's its whole genome. How does it do more with less? It has more than seven functions. Maybe it has 60 functions in the virus life cycle. How does it leverage a few things into lots of functions? The answer, I think, lies in proteins like the matrix protein. Now, the matrix's job is to assemble and bud new viruses from the cell. If you transfect cells with this matrix protein, you will bud out things that look just like filovirus variants. So it gives the virus its shape. It plays some additional role in transcriptional control. So what one might do is solve the structure of a protein to try to understand how it works. Now, this was the first crystal structure of EP40 solved 14 years ago uh, by Winfried Weisenhorn. It was a ring, and it had RNA bound at its center that it picked up from the E. coli expression system. Well, that was a little bit of a surprise because there's no ring structures in the virus, only in the infected cell, and it's a minority of the protein. And there's no RNA in the matrix layer in the virus. So what the ring structure was and why it bound RNA were kind of a mystery. And mutations that prevent formation of rings release perfectly normal variants. So the crystallographers that solved the structure didn't think this was how VB40 assembled the matrix. But a lot of other people thought it might. I mean, that is the structure of the matrix protein. Well, 14 years later, then we solved this structure of VP40 and this crystal structure of VP40. So which one's the right crystal structure? <laughs> the answer is they all are. What this protein does, it seems to be born as a dimer. And then under some biological trigger, at some stage of the virus life cycle, I've drawn it as RNA here, but I know RNA is not enough. Maybe it's an RNA protein complex. Rearranges into the ring. And by doing a lot of mutagenesis that lets us make only one structure and confer only one function, we can show that the ring is a structure that has to do with replication cycle. And that this hexamer here that makes this long zigzagging filament is what builds the matrix and releases viruses from the cell. So this is what I learned on my mother's knee as a biochemist. The central dogma of molecular biology, that the sequence of the gene gives you the sequence of the protein which confers its characteristic fold which drives its function on this one-dimensional highway of destiny that you cannot get off. This is what Ebola virus does. The same amino acid sequence with no post-translational modification, no mutation, no splice variation, just the same sequence can make different structures for different functions at different times. Uh, so this is my favorite analogy. This is what this protein is. <laughs> you can see how in the, I got little boys at home, this is what they like. The same plastic parts make two very different structures in two very different ways. 
But let's say you are accustomed to thinking that if you download the structure from the PDB, that is the structure of the protein, and you can use the structure to make your mutations to understand its biological function. Let's say you never knew this truck existed, and this was the structure you downloaded from the PDB. But you knew that sometimes your protein could walk and talk and shoot, and sometimes your protein could carry cargo and drive 60 miles an hour. But you're going to start mutating the structure to try to understand the cargo carrying function. What you would arrive at is that by flattening the tires, you kill the cargo carrying function. But the tires are the ankles and seat of his pants. And so you assume, well, the guy's got rocket powered pants. And then it turns out that the head is the hydrophobic core about which the engine block is folded. So if you mutate the head, you knock out both structures. So you can see how it would get very complicated if you didn't know there was more than one structure. So here's the important thing, I think, for biology. What we found in this protein is that the single line of code is not a straight program, but more like an if-then statement. It makes different things at different times. It makes a lot of sense for a virus. You know, this thing's, it's an RNA virus. It doesn't have any proofreading machinery. Most mutations are going to be detrimental. Some might confer an advantage, but most will be detrimental. If it can keep its genome small, more or less below the threshold of mutation, most progeny will be viable. If it can find a way of leveraging a small genome into all the functions it needs, that's a terrific virus. So the different structures are for different functions. So is there more information in the genome than we had really thought about before? Rampant speculation, but great to speculate about. The other important question is, well, we've seen that's possible here. Where else would we find it? We hadn't really thought to look about it before. You know, if the structure is solved, you, you ask your postdoc to go work on something else. You don't tell him to go try to solve it a different way and come up with a different structure. It's not part of your common intellectual framework. I think we will find this in other viruses. There are lots of negative strand viral matrix proteins that have all the same series of functions, and they're organized sort of similarly. I think they'll do this too. But what if there's the odd human protein that does this as well? What if there's something associated with a disease like cancer? What if, what if there's some cancer that has it, just the wrong structure at the wrong time? Well, we don't have any high throughput assays to look for that. The, the assays in cancer are, is there a mutation? Well, there's no mutation involved here. The same sequence makes them. Or the assay might be, is the protein um, expressed when it shouldn't have been expressed? Well, the protein's expressed the whole time. You'd have to look for a conformational antibody that only sometimes works. And therein lies the problem. Could this have been predicted? We came upon this quite accidentally. We were expressing this protein to do something else with, and it came off the column at the wrong size. Um, it took us seven crystal structures and 25 mutations and five years and four journals before anybody would believe us that this was true. Was there any cheaper and faster way to have arrived at this solution? You know, structural biology is long and slow and expensive, and it's a labor of love. If, was there any way, by looking at the sequence of this thing, that this could have been predicted? So you would know when you want to spend the effort of looking for another structure instead of assuming there, that is the only structure. And so that's a really big computational problem. How do we wrap our heads around that? Well, the answer fell into my lap about two months ago. The IBM World Community Grid. Uh, this is a humanitarian network of IBM, and it's a network of hundreds of thousands of people with their smartphones and their tablets and their office and home PCs. When they go home at night, their office computer sits idly. It is bored. When they are asleep at night, their phone is sitting there bored. If you link all of these tiny bits of computational power together, you have a massively, you have a massive computational grid. They have been able to use this for a lot of biologically important calculations, and it can kind of do in months what it would have taken you hundreds of years to do in the kind of servers that I have at Scripps. And so they have donated this grid to us to try to answer this problem. And what we've done immediately is, you know, the quick things of, okay, let's just try to get this grid working, and we're going to dock a bunch of little drugs into some little crystal structures that we have. And that all got done in about two weeks when I thought it would take a year. So what we have done to try to wrap our heads around this transformer thing is I've hired a, a computer scientist. He's going to come in February, and we're going to try to understand what aspects of this structural change are understandable or calculatable or predictable, and what are the differences in the energies are. And then can we look at the sequence of this protein and look at sequences of other proteins? And given the database of sequences of viruses that we have and how they mutate in the wild, can we have predict based on what changes and what doesn't change where else we can find this? It's kind of a quixotic quest, but it'll be a lot of fun. Okay, this is my lab at Scripps. I've shown you the work of five of them. 
Uh, Zach did all the work in BB40. Marnie engineered all the Filibar's glycoproteins for structures. Jeff Lee solved the first Ebola structure. Takao Hashiguchi solved the recent Marburg structure. And Daniel Milran did the single particle EM of ZMAP and other antibodies. We have some terrific collaborators. Dem Crow raised the antibodies against Marburg. Yoshikawa Oka did all the microscopy that helped us prove where BP40 goes in cells. John Dye, Gene Olinger, uh, Larry Zeitl, and Gary Covinger have been critical in the Ebola antibody consortium. Michael Hamill up the hill helped us with the SACs. Andrew Ward with the EM. And I'd like to thank NIH, Skaggs, and Bros. Welcome for funding. And I'll answer any questions that you have. Do I have time for questions, or do I run yeah. Thank you for that fascinating talk. Oh, yeah. Do we have any questions? Uh, so she asked um, if there are antibodies in the mucin domain that block athepsin cleavage. We, we think we now have them. So in the, the first pass of antibodies, we brought in 80, and we were able to map more or less where they are. And so there are 16 against the mucin, 17 is glycan cap. And there are some needles in the haystack that confer in vivo protection but not neutralization. So those are interesting to follow up. And we think there are some, and we've kind of mapped where they are, and we think they do block athepsin cleavage. So we're, we haven't done all the in vivo analysis yet, but there certainly remains a possibility that something that blocks cleavage could help. Now, not all of these viruses completely require cleavage. Marburg is a little bit cathepsin independent or it can get cleaved by something else. Ebola is the one that, that has a specific requirement. And luckily, that's the big antibody panel that we have. So we're looking for exactly that thing. Erica? It's a great talk. Thanks. Um, a question about the Ebola antibody consortium. Did you include convalescent serum in that consortium because there's now seems some substantial evidence that it's mm -hmm. effective in patients, all the patients after the first ones were given it. What's the percent knockdown? Is it approaching, how does it compare to ZMAP? Yeah. The, since what we want to find is, some of the questions are which epitopes confer the best protection. We can only get at that with monoclonals. So a lot of the study is single monoclonals, one out of one, which one would you combine? Um, we are going to put the human convalescent sera, and then also we've got lots of animal convalescent sera as a control. Let's look at different cocktails that we come up with. Are they better or not better than sera? So the sera is terrific in the absence of anything else. Um, the worry is that convalescent sera is limited in supply and it's probably variable. Some people make a very strong antibody response. Some people survive without a neutralizing antibody response. We don't know why. So that's another question. Uh, and we're adding immunologists to this consortium to help us address that. And so the concern with using convalescent sera going forward is it might be quite variable. You don't necessarily know what you have. I really like the WHO study that's being done because it's very well controlled and very well characterized. Um, but there are a lot of concerns about black market sera and sera that isn't really convalescent sera and, and who knows what else is in it. But so that's a great control to see if any cocktail that we make recombinantly can match sera. Is it better or is it not better? That's something we'd like to do. You made a kind of offhanded comment about the MAP antibodies only neutralizing in the presence of complement. And I'm kind of curious why that was the case, and if they looked at them in any animal settings where they'd been complement depleted. Yeah, so that's, that's work that they're doing now. So in the absence of complement, they won't prevent the virus from entering cells, because it just gets macropenocytose with the antibodies on there anyway. It doesn't care. The antibodies and their epitopes get cleaved off in the endosome. But if you add complement, you can get some neutralization. It is not as strong as the ones like KZ52, 2G4, 4G7 that bind the base. So some weak neutralization. Um, so the job of those antibodies is to recruit immune effector function. Now, which immune effector function do you want? And in comparing post-exposure emergency treatment to developing a vaccine, are you trying to get the same kind of antibodies or the kind of antibodies you'd elicit from a vaccine? You want different immune effector function than the ones you're giving when someone's already gotten established infection. We don't know the answers to those questions either. And so we're trying to figure out what's the right framework, what's the right function, which ones do we want to put together. 
you know, if the green and yellow, they hit the same spot, what if you stuck them on different IgG frameworks? Then they're not necessarily redundant if you're getting some different immunological function. But this, you know, we don't know any of those questions yet. Those are this the work that we're going to be doing. We've only been doing this study four months now. Yeah? All right. Great. That was really fascinating. Thank Thanks. you so much.